First of all, I want to thank you for giving me a chance to know more about NASA. It's a, a pleasure for me to have you in here. What is your job at NASA? My job at NASA is uh, kind of uh, a little bit of a different uh, flavor than some of the traditional NASA uh, engineers. Uh, my title is a human computer interface technical discipline lead, which basically means that uh, I'm kind of like the, the Johnson Space Center lead for human interfaces uh, with uh, uh, space programs, human space flight programs, because that's what uh, Johnson Space Center does. And so in that capacity, I, uh, I'm, I'm involved with uh, uh, human interfaces, uh, not just with Space Station, which is currently uh, our, our current program, but also uh, the future missions like Orion uh, and then uh, commercial crew. And I spend a lot of time with commercial crew, actually, with SpaceX and uh, Boeing uh, CST-100. Uh, and I'm also um, getting involved with the human interfaces for the human lander system. So my uh, range of, uh, of jobs uh, kind of span all the human, uh, human space flights that NASA's doing uh, from station to, uh, you know, the human lander system. And in addition to that, I'm also doing research uh, with universities uh, through a program here called Texas, Great, uh, Texas Space Grant Design Challenge and giving students problems and challenging them to come up with some ideas for, for future human interfaces. Um, and then <laughs> most recently I've been involved with uh, writing chapters and books. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, I, I kind of get involved uh, in different aspects, but it's all related to uh, human computer interfaces. Of course, everybody wants to hear about SpaceX. So I want to hear more about your contribution to SpaceX. Yes. Uh, so. In SpaceX, uh, my responsibility was the uh, touchscreen panel that you see in some of these pictures. It's a blue, there's three blue screens in front, and those are touchscreens. And so um, my responsibility was working with SpaceX in certification of those uh, screens, if you will, uh, for flight, because we, we go through a process in order to, to certify systems for, for space flight. And because this touchscreen technology is the first time ever the touchscreen technology has ever been used in space flight, it had a lot of attention. Uh, people were worried, a lot of people were worried about it. And uh, there were some challenges, but um, you know, we, we were able to overcome them. My main activity has been with uh, the, uh, the control panel uh, on, on, the, uh, on the SpaceX. And, and just for clarification, what is not mm -hmm. seen on the uh, on those pictures is that you see those three touch screens there, but those are used for uh, what we call non-critical commanding. They can navigate through pages, look at the vehicle status, stuff like that. Right below there are buttons which uh, implement critical functions of the of the spacecraft, and these are tactile buttons. That was also part of the certification process. So there's one like, for example, cutting the parachute. Okay, if the software does not cut it automatically mm -hmm. through the software, they have an emergency button for cutting the, the parachutes. They have emergency buttons for uh, uh, fire suppression. In case there's a fire in there, they just hit that button one time and uh, it, you know, it, it, it turns on the fire suppression system. Uh, there's one with, if they're getting ready to dock with station and something goes wrong with the software and they're getting, they're on a collision course, there's a button that says back away. So the, the spacecraft will automatically back away. So there are some, a lot of uh, emergency uh, commanding right below that beautiful touchscreen display that's mm -hmm. never seen, but it's, it's there and, and it's, uh, it's there for the critical command. What is the most exciting part of your job? Oh. Good question. So I have to say the most exciting part now and even in the past has always been that I kind of, whenever I, I'm assigned to a new project at NASA, I kind of look at it and say, wow, you know, like I'm very fortunate uh, and honored to be in this project because very few people mm -hmm. are ever in this kind of programs or in this kind of job. You know, mm -hmm. like, for example, if you got somebody that's, let's say a truck driver, well, there's truck drivers everywhere in the United States and Amsterdam and France and wherever. 
Earth, but there's just not that many people working on uh, human space flight, uh, go, you know, going to, uh, to outer space. So I have to say that the most exciting part for me is just, you know, working with NASA, working in projects that are, that are uh, helping to explore space understand space and you know when they go live on another planet and uh, to me that's mm -hmm. that's an exciting part i'm glad to be part of that contribution of space exploration especially for the you know, human space flight part and what is your day in nasa consist of oh wow uh, it can vary when i was doing flight projects uh, on space shuttle and that's when i started in, in space station and also the uh, x-38 experimental spacecraft i was doing everything i was wearing different hats i was a design engineer i was a systems engineer uh, safety. I, I did all kinds of different things. So every day can be very dynamic. And, and so, but it's all related to engineering uh, to some extent, uh, having to do with a little bit about budgets and schedules and stuff like that. So uh, my schedule can be, uh, can vary. I can tell you uh, right now for SpaceX and uh, especially Boeing CST-100, we're right now in the, in the review process for SpaceX for looking at the, uh, how SpaceX is going to fly the same hardware over and over and over again. SpaceX likes doing that. And that's fine. Mm -hmm. It's just a matter of demonstrating well, how are you going to demonstrate that? Uh, because every time you fly a spacecraft, or it, it, uh, it gets fatigued. And, and so it loses part of its life, if you will. And so uh, we're, we're looking at that, uh, that information. Uh, looking at the uh, designs, uh, looking at the uh, data from uh, uh, environmental testing, vibration, uh, thermal, uh, the big one, radiation testing of the, of the uh, space flight computers and all that. So there's a lot of that activity that I get, I do, I get involved with on a daily basis. And also because I was telling you about the university students, I'm also coaching or mentoring these students in developing their projects too as well. Sometimes it, it can be like uh, when there's one group of students from South Texas that uh, uh, they can't meet until the weekend. So, uh, you know, I've, I've met with them on Sunday. I've met with them on Saturday, my day off. But, you know, I, I enjoy uh, working with students. So uh, we meet, but it's to help them uh, come, you know, move along because uh, these projects have a certain budget and they have a certain schedule. So they have to meet that so, I try to keep, I got five projects right now with university students, and I'm trying mm. to keep those going <laughs> as well. So that's kind of my daily uh, activity. Uh, in addition to uh, working when I have a chance on, on writing uh, uh, pieces of a chapter on books that I'm working on, I'm working right now, one related to human interfaces, and I'm working on another one, uh, safety critical commanding of robotic systems. Yeah, yeah. I also wonder what is the human interface design for a space mission? And unlike uh, robotic missions, uh, we call them autonomous uh, missions to some extent, which means that uh, there's automatic, there's software that kind of uh, makes the robot do things in an automatic sense. Um, if you mm -hmm. think about, if you ever seen a, um, uh, automobile being built by robots. The robots have certain movements. They grab a piece, uh, move it to the assembly line, another robot comes in wells. And so this is all uh, uh, automatic autonomous. All the robots have predefined movements uh, of a system. But for a spacecraft, there are some things that are automatic, especially when they're launching because things are happening so fast that humans cannot control a uh, a spacecraft uh, that's going so fast into the atmosphere and so many things can go wrong. So that's done all by uh, software. The things that are done by, by humans is the human interface part. Like for example, uh, SpaceX on Demo 2 mission this past summer, uh, they controlled the uh, approach and docking of the SpaceX to space station by touchscreen. And so that's the human interface. There are things about the human interface that are important. First and foremost is making sure that that interface is easy to use okay mm -hmm. and then the second thing is preventing a bad command from getting out and so uh, it, you know there's uh, so many reports and news about airplanes crashing and finding out that mm -hmm. the pilot hit the wrong button or the pilot thought the uh, airplane was in this mode of flying but it was in this other mode and they hit a wrong switch and so mm -hmm. there's confusion there's things like that 
So the human interface has to take into consideration the limitations and capabilities of the human. And that's why this is something new to me, has been new to me for many years, is that my training was in electronics engineering, systems engineering, but the human interface involves the psychology of how mm-hmm. how people uh, think, how people, you know, how they uh, operate in, in different modes, uh, let's call them modes, you know, when they're in the in a depressed state, obviously they're not going to be able to control a uh, system like they do when they're you know happy and jolly. Uh, mm-hmm. So uh, the human interface is critical, not just from commanding, making sure the commands uh, are uh, sent, but also that it takes into consideration that the human may make a mistake, and we have to predict that and and design that in place. For example, if we want them to fire a particular rocket the uh, rocket engine that's going to deorbit SpaceX uh, back to Earth, we don't want them to do it too fast or too, you know, by, you know, by mistake, if you will. And so we mm-hmm. have uh, three levels of commanding. We first say, ready the command, mm-hmm. arm the command, and if everything is uh, set and they really want to do this, fire. <laughs> Hit that button to, mm-hmm. uh, you know, to fire the rocket, okay? So three things have to happen in order for a a critical command to occur. And that's part of human interface design for space uh, missions. Uh, There's other um, industries and agencies that are also in doing that too as well, but that's very critical. Uh, I can tell you that uh, I was not trained in that area when I was going to school. It was just, you know, design Mm -hmm. beautiful circuits, write beautiful (laughs) software, but never thinking about how the human acts and behaves uh, in talking to a machine. And, and if you or you know, even if, uh, if you've ever used an iPhone, sometimes the buttons are so close together and I tend to have a little bit of fat fingers. And so I hit the wrong button and, mm. uh, you know, sometimes you'll, uh, you'll, in, you know, you'll delete a file, which you didn't mean to. I have closed mm. files. <laughs> Yeah. By, by by accident. And, and so, you know, usually some of these uh, systems, they just, if you hit the closed file, it doesn't save it. And so, you know, they don't have any, are you sure, are you sure you want to save it or, or are you sure you want to close it? But anyway, the human interface takes into consideration the hardware, the software, mm-hmm. but more importantly, the human, because you can have the best software that, you know, no errors whatsoever. You can be- have the best hardware that works perfectly in all different environments. But if the human cannot operate that system, the system, and and he he or she makes a mistake, the system Mm -hmm. as a whole has failed. And that's what we're trying to prevent. That's uh, really interesting because I'm thinking, how about the left-handed people? Are you customizing something for somebody who is left-handed, right-handed, or something like that? Well, we have to take that into consideration when we're designing. Yeah, yeah, we have to, when we're actually, when we're designing system, we use something called the, um, the human factors call it the the 95 or 99 percentile so we designed like the height of a seat uh the reach Mm -hmm. of a panel and all that based on the population of the size of the astronaut but we Mm -hmm. also have to take into consideration that an astronaut might be left-handed or Mm right-handed and so depending on what they're doing we design that system but for the most part even a left-handed person you know can operate uh, we, we, we really don't have a left-handed operation or right-handed operation. We have a uh, what we call both-hand uh, operation. Both <laughs> hands have to be used. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. In your opinion, why is it NASA is so eager to go to Mars? I mean, it's obvious to anyone that the solar system, water, moon, and Celadus of Saturn and Jupiter's Europe are much more interesting when it comes to looking life outside Earth. As far as NASA interested in going uh, to the different planets, uh, I have to say that uh, what I think NASA's mission is to explore outer space. And of course, that's kind of a broad term because in outer space, you know, you got asteroids, you got planets and moons and uh, things of that sort. And so, but with a budget permitting, if we get enough budget, you know, we, we want to explore using robots, but also mm-hmm. humans. Uh, and humans have advantages over uh, robots, you know, because humans are more creative when things come up that uh, that robots don't know right? and so 
you can send a robot to, let's say, uh, Europa or, uh, you know, Jupiter or uh, Neptune, and you'll get certain data out of that. But if you, like, if you send a human to Mars, you know, we have the exploratory biology in us that, you know, we, we explore and we get creative using what we have available. And so we're, you know, NASA tries to explore in a two-phase approach. One is robotics operations like perseverance. And then uh, we have this uh, going back to the moon, learning how to live on the moon and then eventually go on to Mars. It's important that we not learn how to live on the moon first before we go to Mars because once we go to Mars, uh, we're going to be Earth independent. We're going to be so far away from Earth that in an emergency, it's going to we can uh, the astronauts cannot depend on mission control. Uh, to come save the day, so to speak, uh, like they do right now with the uh, orbiting space station. There's over 250 people on the ground that monitor the 350,000 sensors on the uh, space station, as well as 200 plus computers. Uh, so once you go to Mars, uh, it's too late. If something bad happens, they have to take care of it. And so those bad situations, we need to practice them on the moon and see how we can, you know, how we can respond to that and design systems for that rather than doing it on Mars. So to go back to your question, we're trying to explore the solar system the best we can. And uh, the two-phase approach is, we call it unmanned or uh, robotics operations and uh, humans, uh, human spaceflight. So we, we're trying to approach space exploration from both aspects. Of it. uh, it's been famous recently about Avilov's uh, interstellar object called Kumuamua. In your uh, opinion, do you believe in the <laughs> I, You know, I think it was Carl Sagan that said uh, extraordinary events require extraordinary evidence. And so, uh, you know, UFOs, uh, if, if we, you know, if we talk about UFOs in terms of uh, intelligent machines, you know, that uh, maybe from other worlds, I mean, they, there might be that possibility, but the, um, right now we've only seen kind of indirect evidence of it in some fashion, you know, they show you know, a picture of a light, you know, going this way and that way, but uh you know, I, I, I tend to be open-minded and, and say that uh, with uh, the universe being so big, so huge, that uh, we shouldn't be so uh, arrogant and saying that we're the only living creatures out there, that maybe there's others that have developed uh, uh, advanced technology maybe, you know, two billion years ago, and they're so advanced right now that, you know, they can come and explore other worlds, and maybe not through uh, their species, you know, if they're by, uh, organic in nature, maybe they're doing it through robotics operation, which actually would would explain the scenario of people saying that they see spacecrafts, you know, zigzagging very fast in the sky. And so humans can't do that. I mean, if you go, let's say, from zero miles per hour or zero kilometers per hour to, let's say, a thousand kilometers per hour, and then stop right there in that spot, what, what happens to your body? You know, the inertia of it makes you go forward. So, you know, if you start zigzagging at that speed, you're, you're gonna bang, you're gonna get banged up in the spacecraft <laughs> and you just won't survive. But robots don't care about that. So UFOs could, you know, maybe one day we'll, we'll, we'll see that happening and we have objective evidence. I'm gonna keep an open mind, but it's, uh, yeah, I, and I, I think one day maybe we'll find out yes or no, but at this point in time, I, I, I'm going to keep my I'm going to keep an open mind and say, yeah, there's a potential that uh, somebody's already developed uh, technology that can go from one, let's say, galaxy to another galaxy, and so mm -hmm. you know they you know they know how to do wormhole traveling, you know, going through mm -hmm. wormholes, which is so uh, we we're not there yet. I mean, we can. Uh, it takes us three days to get to the moon <laughs> and the moon is just the moon is just 250,000 miles away okay it, That's right. it, 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 it took Voyager Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 44 years just to get outside of our solar system our little solar system which is one of billions of solar systems in our galaxy uh, Milky Way and uh, Voyager was traveling at almost 40,000 miles an hour and mm -hmm. at that that speed, uh, it took him almost, four, uh, you know, 40 something years to get out of the solar system. And that's just one little solar system in uh, what's called the Orion arm of the galaxy uh, Milky Way. And so mm -hmm. it, it's just the distances are huge. They're just huge. 
mm-hmm. that we just can't travel those distances uh, without, you know, sending multiple generations where they, you know, one generation dies and another generation continues uh, before we actually get to the to the next, uh, uh, let's say, uh, star system like Alpha Centauri, mm-hmm. which is five light years away. Going back to the UFO question, I, I I'm gonna stay open that mm-hmm. there's technology be- that has been developed long time ago that they can just travel back and forth with no big deal but <laughs> we're still struggling i could, right now i feel like we're like uh like the old west in the united states uh you know in, in covered wagons and horses pulling a wagon you know that, that's the way i feel right now uh, uh compared to maybe uh, other civilizations that perhaps have already gone way past uh, rocket engines, chemical rocket engines. They're, you know, heaven knows what, you know, gravitational uh, forces, you know, for, for traveling through uh, space and time. So, yeah, but it's a definitely a good question. Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> one, one day we'll find the answer. <laughs> yeah. What technology is NASA currently developing that will uh, benefit society? It's a good question because, you know, we have, uh, and here's the other thing. Uh, we have 10, 10 major centers, uh, NASA, mm-hmm. you know, sometimes when students say, I want to come work at NASA <laughs> and, uh, uh, you know, it's, yeah, but there's NASA, you know, NASA, because, you know, NASA stands for National Aeronautics and Space Administration. So there's the aeronautics part. We have an, uh, Armstrong Research Facility. Uh, we have Langley Research Facility that does uh, NASA centers are involved with aeronautics to a, to a large extent. And then Goddard Space Flight Center, uh, Glenn Research Center does uh, uh, satellites, J- uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory does robotics, uh, NASA Johnson Space Center, Marshall Space Flight Center, Kennedy Space Center is involved with human space flight. And so we have all these centers and we get a lot of research scientists and engineers working on you know, technology uh, for, uh, you know, for the next generation uh, missions. So it's kind of hard to answer your question because um, I don't know what's going on with the, with the other centers as, as what they're doing. Because, you know, like, for example, we got some folks in my group uh, that are involved with some uh, advanced uh, communications systems, but uh, they don't want the word to get out yet because they're still working on it. So the, a lot of it is kind of a secret you know, to some extent until they can mature it. Because they, what you don't want to do is say, hey, I invented the best, uh, you know, wheel or I invented the best uh, steering column or whatever. And then it uh, comes to, uh, to find out that it wasn't good after all, you know, something bad on it was, you know, failed. And so we we do a lot of testing before we you know get the word out that, you know, something has mm-hmm. been invented. But I mean, like right now, I, I know that on the Mars Perseverance, there's some technology that uh, could be beneficial for the humans. You know, there's a uh, laser system. I think they're using fluorescence Gestapo-T, and the other one is called Ronan, Ro- Raymon. So basically, it's this technology that can find bacteria at a very, very tiny, minuscule level, way, be- way beyond what we do right now. And so that technology could conceivably be used for, uh, let's say, uh, identification of a bacteria bacteria growing real in the early stages uh, in a hospital or, 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 or whatever, and probably could even detect bacteria on a, uh, on a, on a wound on a person, just very simply like the, if you ever you know, see Star Trek, you know, they have the, the tricorder that they put close to the body and they can analyze the body. Uh, in terms of, mm-hmm. you know, what's wrong with that person. So, you know, we're, we're starting to get closer and closer to um, to these uh, systems that can send, let's say, radio signals or laser signals and analyze the body for being sick, if you will. So maybe one day they'll, we'll have something along those lines, you know, that can, that can you know, detect the COVID virus very quickly, uh, as mm-hmm. opposed to right now where, I don't know, in your country, but in our country, the way they do it is they put the swab up your nose and, yeah. uh, you know, and then the, the uh, uh, so it happened to me. Uh, I hated it. Yeah, so, I hate uh, it also. You know, that kind of, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> going back to perseverance is also, uh, they're mm-hmm. doing an experiment on their call. It's called Moxie. And that experiment is to look at the feasibility, the feasibility of uh, taking soil and creating oxygen out of that soil as well as water. And so that's going to be very important for, uh, 
for future emissions, especially when we go to uh, Moon and Mars, because there's obviously on Moon, there's no oxygen, but on Mars, there's very little, but it's very poisonous. So we need to create our own oxygen. And so that kind of technology, maybe not so much the oxygen part, because, you know, right now at this point in time, we got plenty of oxygen here on Earth, but uh, perhaps uh, the, the part of, of creating, going from soil to, uh, let's say, a water or a fuel might be of a, a benefit for, for humans. And here's the interesting part is that about uh, space exploration is that uh, you know, as we start going out and exploring how to keep humans alive and healthy mm -hmm. is that technology could benefits here on earth and I, I and I go back to the Apollo program the Apollo program came up with so much new technology that benefited uh, humans here on earth uh, and that it was because you know we had to figure out ways how to send humans to to the moon and along the way, you know, we started to learn about all this, uh, you know, the uh, better food packing techniques for preserving food for a longer period of time, uh, for medical systems, you know, for monitoring patients uh, remote. Uh, of course, you know, the astronauts being on the moon, that's a very far remote patient, uh, but they use that technology now for ambulances. Whenever there's an accident, uh, somebody is uh, in critical uh, condition, they take that, uh, they, they hook them up and they transmit that information back to a doctor at a hospital and they can see the status of the patient. How bad are they hurt? So, and there's many, many other technologies that were developed uh, along the way that uh, it'll, it's, it'll be amazing, you know, the, the, the stuff that, that we're going to benefit. But the only way to do cutting edge work like that is to kind of force ourselves to, uh, you know, to reach further out, you know, to, uh, you know, challenge ourselves. And that's how you come up with new technologies. And so the, I think one of the benefits of the space program is, uh, and is the fact that we are reaching further and further out. And along the way, we're going to develop technologies that'll benefit uh, people on Earth. So I don't know of any right now that you know that I'm aware of, but I'm sure they're going to be coming out in the next few years uh, uh, once they um, let's say perfected the technology, and it's available for what we call technology transfer, where it, be it becomes now a commercial product. What's your take-home message to aspiring people who think of joining NASA? Well, I know there's uh, obviously students out there that are uh, not U.S. Mm -hmm. citizens, and that's one of the, the, the challenges. You know, the students tell me, you know, how can I come work at NASA if they're from India or uh, uh, other countries? And and so right now, NASA, at least in the United States, both the uh, NASA government, which I belong to, the NASA government, and then the contractors that support us uh, are all U.S. citizens. But I. I have to say that don't let that uh, be a roadblock that, um, you know, it's it's a challenge, but you have to take on the challenge. There's a young lady that five years ago approached me and she was in high school from India and she wanted to come work at NASA. And I told her, it's going to be hard. Uh, you're not a U.S. citizen. She said, well, I don't care. Tell me how do I get there? And so I told her, I said, you know, get your bachelor's uh, in engineering uh, in India and then apply for your master's program at a university here in the United States. And she did. She got accepted to Syracuse University up in New York. Uh, she got her master's there and then uh, said, okay, now you got to go for a PhD. Uh, and she's going to, she's working on um, artificial intelligence and uh, machine learning, which is a big thing for NASA. And so there's uh, professors that, that do work for NASA that uh, do that kind of research. So I said, find yourself a professor that's doing research with NASA and then come join that professor, you know, for your PhD. And so she did, she actually found one at San Diego State University. And so wow. in the last episode, she uh, she's going to be working for a professor that, that supports uh, uh, Jet Propulsion Laboratory, which is one of our NASA centers. So in total, something like six years, but and she did it. And, and so, wow. I, you know, it's um, I can say that for myself, too, as well, that you have to have your heart. You know, if, you, if your heart is in it, you, you will succeed. It's just going to take time. And uh, um, I, I also give the example of one astronaut. He, he, he retired recently from NASA, but it took him almost 21 years before he finally got accepted as a uh, astronaut. So mm -hmm. it's, uh, wow. he was, but he was 
he was persistent. Every year he kept applying, he got declined, he applied again until eventually he got selected. So it, it takes uh, dedication, determination, and uh, you know, it, and I don't like the word failure uh, because what I've learned over the years is that failure means you stop trying. Okay. Mm -hmm. So if you stop trying, you fail in that area. But as long as you keep trying, however long it takes, and maybe it, it takes you to a new road. Maybe it, it's something different that you, you didn't expect. But the important thing is, you know, always keep trying and uh, you'll suffer. You're, you're going to suffer setbacks, but don't let those uh, stop you. Follow that dream that you have uh, until you get there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> that's so, yeah. That's all I okay, sounds great, it? My pleasure, my pleasure, my pleasure. I enjoyed it. Uh... Thank you again. <laughs> I can't <laughs> stop saying thank you. <laughs> ah, thank you. Yes. Have a nice day. Hi, George. Good morning. Well, good afternoon over there. Good morning here. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice we have the same background. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> <It's popular. laughs> yeah. Yeah.